So I'm going to talk about a few initiatives that I've been involved in that have been asking uh, themselves the question, what rules do we need to make about data governance and ethics? And uh, just maybe as a disclaimer, I'm a technical researcher first. Uh, I prove things normally, um, which means sometimes I handle real data, but normally I prove generic results about methods that work for generic types of data. So this is uh, a little bit further away from that. Uh, so just to get it uh, all in the same box, we're talking data and data science. We all know what these things are. And we're talking about automated methods of making sense of data that's arisen in a data science context. Uh, we get a lot of other words thrown in. I think the automation piece is important per se, uh, just because it allows for situations to occur without the human in the loop. Uh, but of course, data arises in many settings, such as the Internet of Things, and being able to make sense of such large volumes of data, normally we do have to have uh, quite significant computational facilities. And I just wanted to put that on one side compared to machine learning, because often when I go to meetings, everything just gets jumbled up into whatever. Uh, so machine learning is really automatic methods of constructing algorithms to predict and make sense of data. And point two, I cannot stress sufficiently, so this is well known and probably you all know about it already. Um, but there are two different frameworks where we make sense of data. One is the predictive framework. So that's kind of asking, if someone gives me this lot of data, can I predict a set of data I haven't seen before? And the second one is trying to extract information, often by having an explanatory framework saying, I think we have these types of curves in the data. How do I get them out? And I think what's important to make a point of here is that most machine learning algorithms are created in a predictive setting. Uh, they're made so that we can predict data that we did not use to make the algorithm. If we do that, then we're cheating. So we better not do it uh, when people are watching anyway. Uh, and it's not aimed to be explanatory. Like the way you develop a machine learning algorithm, it's not meant to explain the data. It's meant to predict the data well. And as you can see, uh, just from the example of the curve up there, uh, the green uh, would be a, like a sine curve, a periodic curve that repeats with a regular interval. And we've shoved some noise on it. If we want to understand it, we want to get the green curve, the sinusoid out. But the red curve would do a perfectly good job if we wanted to predict it. Uh, and also in this setting, uh, usually people try to split out different types of learning. Reinforcement learning doesn't really deserve its separate bullet. It's just it's become very popular lately, and that's why people tend to mention it. Otherwise, uh, we talk mainly about supervised and unsupervised learning. And if we want to talk about them as mathematicians, we would talk about clustering, trying to find groups in data versus classification. What type of data do I have, like the duck and the not the duck in the picture? And I'm not going to uh, go through that. Uh, so just having set all of those things aside, we all know what AI are. AI is trying to find intelligence in machine. And they might be more concrete and specific goals, such as planning, natural language processing, et cetera. And what people generally pull up is sort of a fear of general AI, of machines becoming cleverer than human beings. But most AI systems today are examples of narrow AI. They're designed for a particular problem and solving that problem, which is not the same as machine learning. Like most methods people use to try to do AI are machine learning. But machine learning and AI are not the same. And none of this has necessarily anything to do with robots. And I've got a picture of Ada Lovelace on the side, uh, perhaps uh, appropriately, since we had a speaker from the Ada Lovelace Institute here earlier today. Um, so why are we talking about automated decisions in this framework? So we might use machine learning and AI to make automated decisions. But why are we concerned about ethics? So a lot of the technologies that people use, they were developed for recommender systems. Basically, uh, a way of ranking items to be recommended to a user dependent on theirs and others' past behavior. Now, that's a special case of an automatic decision. You choose to show something someone that they might buy or not. 
Uh, but of course, automation can take many, many different forms. And we've sort of seen uh, various examples of that, uh, such as Lawbot, which tries to uh, create a chatbot that helps people interact with the law in a more sensible way. And you can see why people would want to do this. Uh, justice is not available at a cheap price generically for everyone. So getting an automated system that is very cheap and ubiquitous in its availability has the potential of increasing justice. So, uh, I mean, when we start to talk about ethics and correct behavior, it's very tempting to sort of want to take all of technology and throw it away somewhere, but we have to make decisions, whether we like to or not. Making no decision is also making a decision. And the hope is that using data and algorithms that will make better decisions. So why has all of this sort of stuff come up right now? Well, first we've got a situation where we're collecting more data than before, and we're collecting it almost without thinking, so ubiquitous sensing. So we've got automatic collection of data just in case the data might have value to us. Uh, most of these are human subjects data. What does that mean? Sensitive data about people, uh, which you might not necessarily want to share with everyone else. Um, the third ingredient that makes modern data collection very special is that we don't have a sampling paradigm. So those of us that trained as mathematicians will have been brought up on uh, people doing agriculture in the early 1900s and planting beets in different parts of different fields and having designed experiments of putting one type of beet in one field and another type of beet in another field. That's very much a designed experiment. And then you can control for the manure and whether the field is in water or whatever you like and the beet because you've actually uh, controlled for all of it. But the whole notion of ubiquitous sensing is you <coughs> collect data just because it happens to be there. There is no design whatsoever. And the arguments that initially came out was we don't need design because we got all the data. But unfortunately, uh, well fortunately for people like me who are mathematicians, this is cool because this gives a lot of new mathematics and problems that we have to solve. But examples are, for instance, the Twitter data set that came from Hurricane Sandy, uh, where if you just go on the raw Twitter data, if you think that the storm is worse where there's most Twitter, you would think that central Manhattan was worst hit by Hurricane Sandy. Um, the street bump application was never used as it was meant to do. It was supposed to detect places in Boston where the streets needed fixing, and it was a, a piece of software people put on their smartphones. But of course, smartphone usage is not uniformly distributed over a city. And so that was, again, bias. Uh, so bias is sort of one of the main issues that arise for all these types of data. And this is different than the bias we'll see in the news. The bias we'll see in the news is about people having made biased decisions using information we don't want them to use, like gender or race or something else contentious. This is just the data that you have is not what you think it is. Uh, and then the last thing to worry about is really the fidelity of the data. So that comes back to the bias and our ability to generalize to new situations we haven't been in yet, which would not be true for the data that was in bullet point four, just because it, there was bias in the collection. So what else has changed? Well, we have more computational power, and that's what made the whole machine learning revolution happen. Uh, you've all seen the XVs, where you can put in X, whatever number you'd like. And I think this whole prediction paradigm, rather than explanatory paradigm, is something new. And it's quite interesting, because the prediction paradigm is spreading into areas where people traditionally did have explanatory models, like astrophysics, like oceanography, like geophysics, where people think they know what the correct model of the data is, but they still want to try these new methods. So I think it's very, I mean, the methods are very powerful, so it's good to use them, but it's important to realize what you're optimizing for and what you want to get out. And then sort of a new ingredient that's also here is that it's, it can be hard to separate the data from the algorithm. The algorithms work because you have the data. So you, again, classically mathematically trained, we're used to proving things about algorithms, whether they're good and bad and what properties they have. But here, nothing works without the data. So it doesn't even make sense to think of the algorithm outside of the data. 
And that's when you get uh, quite a lot of concerns coming out from these facts. So we, we started out with just collecting data because we could. That brings concerns about have we sort of ended up in a surveillance society. Uh, very complex predictive modeling leads to questions of transparency. But again, it's important here to put this in context. If there is nothing else that works, sometimes people are willing to sacrifice transparency in exchange for something that works. Uh, fairness has taken up a lot of the debate, both here in the US, especially uh, related to uh, a system called Compass, which I have a paper on the right-hand side there talking about, which is trying to figure out, well, originally it was trying to help uh, the Compass system was not designed to help make parole decisions, but it was repurposed for that purpose. Uh, the UK has its own Compass. Um, it's in Durham, and it's called HART, Harm Assessment, or well, whatever the last two letters are, I forgot. Um, but what I think what makes people considerably less worried about it in the UK is that uh, the people who've deployed HART, which is a huge decision tree, and therefore quite hard to understand, uh, is it, it's never used automatically. It's only used with a person who uses it with many other sources of information. So what sort of consequences have all of these developments, which are technologi technologically driven developments, have? Well, various societies have come up with reports on how we should view the usage of massive data sets. So the Royal Society and the British Academy have had a project on data governance, which has produced a report, and I'll mention it a little bit more later. The Royal Society has had a project on machine learning, and the IEEE uh, has had one on ethical considerations in AI and autonomous systems. There's also a big data report coming out of the German version of the Royal Society, Academy of Sciences Leopoldina. Uh, the French Conseil National de Numérique has also come up with a report and of course, this year we got the new GDPR. Uh, so what, what's the sort of high level messages that come out of these reports? The Royal Society Machine Learning talks about the needs for standards, especially as we're gonna be extending the life cycle of data. So we need to have clear standards on how we want people to use them. Uh, the need for public buy-in. So the Royal Society commissioned uh, with Ipsos Mori a study uh, where people looked at public opinions Actually, could anyone in this room guess what the most dangerous usage of AI is, according to the public? No. You will never. It's so <laughs> out of the box, you will not guess it. <laughs> so artificial art and poetry. So the, 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 the focus group I was in said with clear determination that we could lose our humanity. And the biggest danger to us was artificial poetry and art, which surprised me. Surprised me a great deal. <laughs> um, the report also brought up the governance of data use and mentioned uh, some of the fears such as harm replacement. So that's about automation altogether of not needing humans to do work anymore. Uh, fairness is something I've already mentioned, and transparency. And relate. I think transparency most often comes up related to fairness, because how can you tell if something's fair if it's not transparent? I think the automation, sort of the replacement discussion is something we'll be having for a while, because it's going to take a while for the chips to come down. Um, and then the Royal Society made a joint report with the British Academy just on data. Um, Again, most of those points are sort of obvious. Uh, some of the interesting separate points which I haven't seen overall is that this report drew out that human flourishing is the overarching principle of why we should use data, i.e. we should use data so that people do well. Um, none of the other reports I've seen actually says that. And um, they also advocated for a new body to steward the data landscape. Uh, which some of them um, seem to be resonating. Uh, the IEEE report is interesting because IEEE is a truly international organization. Uh, so the Royal Society is a British, as is the British Academy, as you can tell from its name. Uh, engineers are also very much focused on technical solution. 
So uh, the discussions about uh, personally identifiable data very quickly became one of access control and what technological solutions one could have to access control. Um, and also being a truly international discussion, the regional jurisdiction versus global citizen became uh, a sort of a clear question that people started to discuss. Uh, and the sort of the dangers, um, I mean, the IEEE is a technology embracing organization. So it also started to bring up the dangers of having, being too conservative as sort of going in the other direction and being scared of technology. Namely that if people are worried about transparency and usage of data, they might withhold information or give uh, erroneous information just to avoid having to deliver it. And then uh, the last one, which is interesting, this is a British one. Uh, so the, law, the UK Law Society has a technology and law policy commission on the usage of algorithms in the justice system. It is set up to examine the use of algorithms in the justice system in England and Wales and what controls are needed to protect human rights. Um, it, the early evidence, so that it's going to have three evidence sessions. The first evidence session treated bias and fairness as well as standards in quite some detail. And if you want to get involved, you could have a chat with me or you can just go to the website of the Law Society. Um, so I think the main points of this is, I think we're going to see more of, of these types of reports. The debate is very much ongoing, unfortunately, because we're very much in a situation where national interests are rising, but I mean, this is globally exploitable data. So it's going to be quite hard to land somewhere which actually has real impact. Because all these national bodies can say lots of stuff, but what difference does it make in practice, right? Because most of the big international corporations are international. Uh, something like GDPR and having lots of European countries bound together makes a difference, but individual nations don't have so much impact. And uh, if you look at the, all of the different AI strategies, so I've stolen this from someone who's better at drawing than me, uh, you will see that almost any self-respecting nation has come up with an AI strategy. And most of them contain information uh, about ethics. So uh, quite a few of these have uh, declared themselves as this is the place where ethical AI is going to be done. So the UK Lords report was very much in that vein. Also the French report, which uh, is just France AI strategy, was, which was based on a report by the mathematician Cédric Villani. So I think we're going to see more. You can see they're sort of more than doubling between 2017 and 2018. We're going to see more reports, whether that actually leads to anything practically implementable or changes of law is something we'll see as time progresses. Thank you.